people from Cambridge, Amherst is here. You should see this workload changing in real time as more people answer. So definitely, I feel like we have more of Metro Boston presence. No one from Australia is here, obviously. Okay, okay, so we have a couple answers. So keep your phones or laptops open on this page uh, because not only you can participate in polls, but you can also uh, ask questions uh, anytime, at any time and then upvote other questions. Okay. So let me start my presentation by thing I do every time, which is to say that uh, the climate crisis is a serious problem. And unless we do something really, really soon, not only our children, but even ourselves, we're not going to survive. So it's bad. You know, we have to act today, changing my behavior. I really enjoy online presentations when you don't have to fly somewhere, you don't have to travel very far. But also things like, you know, solar electricity, electrical bikes, things like that are really important. But even more important, it's not a personal thing. I don't think any one of us can change the whole planet. So if you are in Massachusetts, and I know where you live right now, many people are in Massachusetts, you should join one of these organizations. Even in Boston GS Slack channel, we have climate action where I sometimes post things that we can all do. And the best thing about uh, Massachusetts, I think, is that we have enough natural resources like wind that we can get all our energy needs many times over, but we have to act now. Okay. So let's go to something technical. I had a long journey from C++ and C Sharp and Java all the way to front end and Node.js. Um, you can find everything I've done online at slides.com, at Gleabach, at my blog. So um, if you want to see anything that I've done, you know where to find. Um, my machine is a little bit on a on a slow side. Okay, I work for Cypress.io. It's the best end-to-end -end test runner that one can ask. So if you ever need to test a web application, just try it out. It's free and MIT licensed. Let me stop streaming maybe because I think that's... Okay, in this presentation, I will explain how service workers work. I'll give a couple of examples, what you can use it for, things like caching, offline support, but then we'll do some other cool things. Well, hopefully you'll find them as cool as I, I do usually. Uh, Jim, I'm trying to like go to the next slide, but it's like a little bit like molasses on my machine mm. for some reason. Okay. Um, yeah, mine was a little slow too when I was doing it, or at least it seemed slow to me. Um, it's not going at all for you though, huh? Oh, it, it kind of goes back and forth. Okay. Uh, um, I yeah. Most um, okay. Yeah, I think, um, I think the service might be sluggish. We'll, we'll bear with you though. Um, thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, one question I want to ask people, and if you go to a slide, though, let me start the next poll. Uh, come on, load, load. I, I want to ask people if how familiar you know people are with web workers or service workers. And unfortunately, oh, people are voting. Yes. So if you go to Slido, you should be able to vote. I see that 17% or 11% are familiar with web workers, 33 with service workers, and for the rest, it's a new topic. So excellent, excellent. This is what I kind of thought we would have. Um, that means, you know, I'll, I'll show the basics of web workers. Oh, come on, like, this is a little bit ridiculous. 
Jim, let me stop recording on my machine because I don't think. Sure. If if we can't get it faster, maybe I mean if we want to get real crazy. I could present your slide, and you could just tell me when to next them. <laughs> it, it's a nice idea. I don't think it would work very well though. <laughs> Uh, why is it? I apologize for this. Oh, let me, I already closed. Okay, so in a nutshell, a service worker is a technology that completely blurs the line between what is a server processing, what runs on your local machine or in a browser. It used to be very, very clear. You either download an app or a, a desktop application and it runs on your machine. And then you have, and then it communicates with the server. When you open a browser, well, it's something running in a browser that only can communicate with the server. But the service workers kind of blur the line of what is running where and what the capabilities are. So the most basic inspiration for actually creating service workers was that our Wi-Fi isn't perfect, as we you know. If you cannot connect to the internet, if signal falls in a forest, well, nobody will hear a scream. So people were trying to solve a problem of websites being unavailable offline mode by writing application cache, where you, you the website offer, would say, okay, my page needs the following resources in order to work. And you list them all, and when you say, if something will fall back, you know, go to the network or go to this, like just load HTML page. And it turns out that this declaration of resources is really, really hard. And especially hard because sometimes you want to clear certain resources for some situations or cache them. Turns out like it's very, very imperfect technology. You cannot use a single text list to cache and handle all the possible situations. So then people came up with a service worker. In a normal browser, you have your page. That's where you see HTML, input boxes, buttons, and so on. That's what you interact with. If you have heavy processing, you can offload some of that processing to web workers, which each page can create a bunch of, and they can run on different CPUs and just do you know, heavy crunching so they don't slow down your browser process. And then the service worker is additional, almost like a web worker, but it's only once per domain. And it acts like a proxy. So if your browser is requesting a resource, and this could be anything, it could be the page itself, could be static JavaScript, could be an image. So if your browser is requesting a resource, it goes through the service worker, and the service worker can, you know, Transform the request, for example. Or it can let it pass. And in that case, the request will go to the server. The server responds. The service worker can transform the response or let it through. And then your page receives it and, and you know, can render an image or process you know, JSON response, things like that. The best thing about the service worker is that from the point of view of your page, nothing has changed. It literally doesn't know that there is one more proxy layer of interaction between the browser and the server. So that means the service worker just intercepts things, stays there, and you can just bolt it on to existing website with no problem. I've been kind of watching this page, you know, how widely service workers are supported out in the wild. And this page has been changing, you know, year over year, like one, one more browser became green, but now 93% of all browsers out in the wild support it, right? The only one you really have to worry is IE 11. And don't worry about IE 11. So luckily, if you're asking, is service worker ready to be used? The answer is yes, go ahead. The environment. The browser, what you have in the page, is a product of long history of development of HTML and HTTP. So things like XML GP requests, like local storage, you know, all those technologies, they all carried, you know, from, from the past, right? From like 10 years ago. When web workers were created, 
they got the newer APIs because you know you start from scratch. You don't have to support all code. So there you can use, for example, things like uh, cache API, which is asynchronous replacement for local storage. And when the service worker is the newest environment, and it kind of models the web worker, but it even removed things like XML, HTTP requests, uh, local storage, all the things that are kind of deprecated. And instead, it's all promise paid. It has very new, uh, very clean API. But the web worker and service workers, they don't have access to your document, right? Think of uh, you know, a proxy on your network. It doesn't have access to your uh, um, computer, right? So the only way for your browser to communicate with service worker and get responses are by exchanging messages using post message. So it's kind of isolated. If you want to use a service worker from your page, you have to say navigate a service worker register. And then you give a path to the JavaScript that will be loaded as a service worker. Uh, the restriction is it has to be HTTPS, right? So when Jim showed how he like uh, set up um, less encrypt certificate and that didn't work well, in that case, he could not load the service worker because it's insecure. And as we will see down the line, the service workers are super powerful. You can still load them on local host without a GPS, that's fine. But in, in reality, when you deploy something, you have to deploy it to HTTPS site. Okay. Inside the service worker, everything is event-based. So the service worker, after it registers, can add event listeners, for example, what happens when it gets installed? What happens when it gets activated? Like when, when you unload installed and then go to the page again. Uh, if a page sends a message, there is a message event. And then the push event is for other things. The most interesting event that I'll be talking about is the fetch. Whenever a page requests a static resources or does fetch our you know, AJAX request, the service worker can intercept those by listening to the fetch event. And then it can do all things. And what we'll see down the line is pretty much the different types of fetch uh, logic. So the first thing I want to show is this video of adding offline support by using a service worker. So I don't think, ah, oh, I do have it, yeah. Uh, Jim, can you hear audio from the page? I can't hear the audio from the Okay, video. so I'll, I'll just narrate, right? So, if we disconnect from Wi-Fi and we have a regular page, well, obviously nothing is loading, right? So the first thing we want to do is we want to add a service worker. We can check a service worker is uh, supported in this browser, and it should be 93% of browser support. So in this case, we'll register a service worker and we provide a path to local JavaScript script, this one. And right now it just says hello, right? So when we load it, we can have we can see this little special icon, a gear icon, and then we can see that the service worker has registered. Right now, it does nothing. So if we go to offline mode, nothing happens. It's not magic. The service worker is not a single line that adds offline support. But then we can say, for example, when you install service worker, you want to cache these URLs, and the slash is the page itself. And then the app CSS is the app CSS, the resource that it loads. So we'll say, on install, wait until you open cache and add all those URLs to that cache that's inside the service worker. That means when first time you install it, it will cache the page and that app CSS file. OK? And then whenever page requests it, Right down the line, maybe on reload. Then we'll get the URL of the resource that the page needs. We'll open the cache, and then we'll see if there is a matching request that we already have stored. All right. So we'll slow down the initial install by caching two files, but then we'll see if if they're available next time when the page loads. 
Okay, so what happens now? The page has installed, it downloaded the localhost and app CSS. And then if we go to offline mode and reload, notice, right, the localhost was for uh, re like returned from service worker, right? It shows from service worker. App CSS was returned. And then it requested, you know, again, uh, that file, but we're offline, so we could not load the new copy. So this is how easy it is to fetch, or like, not fetch, um, cache specific resources so your page works offline. Uh, don't forget, if you have any questions, just add them to Slido, and I'll be happy to answer them. So this is what we have seen, right? You can cache certain resources and then return uh, resources whenever the page needs them from cache. The good thing about uh, programming service workers is that everything is promise-based, but you don't have to do promises because if your browser supports uh, service workers, it does support async await syntax by default. So you can just write async and await inside. So when you open, let's say cache right here, you can just say await asynchronous operation and then get the things. The same with fetches works really, really well. So the code is pretty clean. You can have multiple strategies for caching, and this is the power, right? Compared to app cache technology, service workers allow you to do, hey, do you want to cache everything? Do you want to cache, and then if a resource is not found, you want to go to the network? Or maybe you want to return the cache resource, meanwhile, go back to the server, see if it's updated, uh, you know, resource and then put it in a cache. So the next time you get the new resources, maybe you want to let everything through. Maybe you don't cache anything. Or maybe you want to go to the network and if network is unavailable, only then return the cache resource. And in reality, you don't write those, you know, strategies yourself. Google has an excellent library called Workbox. You just use it as any NPM dependencies and you say, I want to use this strategy here are the files I want to cache, and here's a strategy. And you can combine multiple strategies and say, cache these files first, but for these files, go to the network and only use a fallback if the network is unavailable. So really great library for giving you offline support for your web apps. Another interesting thing that people have done with service workers is prefetching and preloading views, but dynamically and you know, very, very quickly. So I want to show this demo. And in this case, watch what happens, but watch not the mouse as it hovers over the blog, but watch the DevTools network console, okay? So let me play the video. So the user goes, hovers the blog, and as soon as the user hovered, all right, check, check, I'll show it again. As soon as the user hovered, even before clicking, the blog resource, right, is fetched. All right, so he, here's the explanation for what is going on. So we have the browser, the service worker, and the server. So as soon as the user hovers over the click, right, the chances are high that if the user hovers with a mouse over the link, eventually the user will click on the link and fetch it, All right? So as soon as the user hovers, the browser is sending a, a fetch, well, it's not really a fetch. It, it can post a message to service worker saying, hey, prefetch this particular URL for me. Because the user is likely to want it. It goes to the server. The server responds with the next that resource. It goes into the cache inside the service worker. And then the user might decide, hey, I really want to see that link. Click on the link. The browser can say, hey, fetch me as they normally do. And in this case, the next page that the user wants to see is already in a cache. So you don't even have to go to the server because you just fetched it. And so you return this cached version that has just been fetched. And the best thing about this is this delta. The user might not click the link immediately, right? Hover in like in one millisecond click, right? Usually there is like 10, 50 milliseconds between going to the link 
and clicking. So you have this delta. What's your advantage? What's your head start for fetching that resource and making available? And if a user hovers but doesn't click, well, well, you you wasted one prefetch, but that's fine, right? But on a on a side where you have a lot of resources, you don't have to cache everything, but you still will see this in well, a very close to instant fast behavior. Uh, another example where service workers were, are very useful is, you know, just testing when your website how it deals with, let's say, offline conditions, delays, things like that. So imagine, well, this is what you don't even have to imagine, but this is a library I have written called Turtle Service, a uh, Service Turtle, because it's uh, service worker that can slow down your request. It's, it's a turtle. You load that, uh, that library, and then you can say, whenever someone wants to get URL, respond with 502 error code, but after three seconds. And what this turtle.get does, it just sends a message to the service worker saying, whenever the page actually does this request to get uh, some URL, return this error code. Don't go to the server. And now there is a very nice library that actually goes very far beyond what I have written called MSW, where you can say, or you can define all sorts of stubs and all sorts of behavior. And in your application, I'm trying to go to the next. Okay. In your Application, you can say, if I'm running inside the development or test environment, actually start mocking. So if you're running in production, there'll be no service worker, or it will just pass everything through. But if you're running in a test environment, those mocks will become available. And from the, and like from the viewpoint of your application, there are no application code changes, no environment variables, no flags, nothing. It's completely a separate thing. And your page is completely unaware that there is the stubbing and, and proxying server changing the actual network responses. Another example where service workers will become really, really useful are in this weird intersection between client apps, server-side rendered apps, and maybe a little of a jam stack. So, Here's a question that I want to pose to you. How do you start a web application really, really quickly? All right. So imagine you have a web app, you're already using CDNs, like all the resources are parallelized, HTTP2, everything, small images, bundle JavaScript, you know, everything. So how do you do what do you do after that? So in a typical application, you are responsible you know, for HTML, JS, CSS, but then those things are usually hosted somewhere. Could be GitLab pages, could be CDN, could be Netlify, highly optimized already there, right? You are really responsible for writing good application for how you're loading the data and how you're rendering or drawing the data on a page, right? That's your responsibility. That's what you can control. So everything up to getting data and rendering is really cached by the browser. So unless something changes, browser will cache, you know, JavaScript bundle, CSS, HTML, all those things. How are you getting the data and what, how you controlling the rendering when you redraw the page, it's up to you. That's what you can control how to cache it, right? So. This part, right, where you load the application, where you request the data and you render, that's the expensive part, especially on Bootstrap. So as an example, here's a pivotal tracker. I took this video a while ago, so like it's not true representation of their performance right now. But so here's what I'm doing. I loaded this giant project, right? And when I reload the page, and look what happens, right? It's loading and loading, and then it loaded. And when I reload again, and again, it's the same thing. It's loading and loading, and when it loads, right? So why am I waiting if I'm just reloading the page, right? Nothing has changed there. 
the data is the same, it should load really, really quickly, right? Uh, another thing that you notice is that when it loads, you you probably have half a second before you actually can interact with a page, like as, as a human being, right? You, you can't be like, okay, 10 milliseconds after on data load event, I'll click on a button. You just can't, you're not fast enough. So if you look at what, you know, the page does, right, it, you know, they, they do some nice things, right? They put some, you know, ASCII art in a console. Uh, what is really bad in modern web apps is like the amount of JavaScript you load and evaluate just before you can bootstrap your app and scaffold is unbelievably large, right? And that's what actually slows down your page. That's what has to happen before you can interact. So in this case, for like four seconds, you, you have to wait until you actually render things. So let's look at what it leads to is this frustrating behavior where you load usually in a web application, right? And this is not Jamstack, right? Jamstack is perfect. It has a full page right out of the box. But in a client-side app, you usually load something that's like scaffolding application, right? Then application code loads, and then it loads its data. And when the data gets rendered on a page, like shifting inside the app, right? And that's the jump you see where first you see just the header, and then you want to click on something, and all of a sudden, like, boom, there is a whole bunch of stuff that just got rendered, and your link on a footer is absolutely in a different place. So let's rethink this problem a little bit, right? So our app loads the data, renders HTML. Our HTML is a product of data. So if the data is the same, HTML should be the same. That's the trick that all the frameworks use to hydrate the page, right? They say, we'll pre-render the page from the data, we'll ship the data, user will look at pre-rendered static page, and then we'll render the app again, but now it's all like live and dynamic, but it will render the same thing, so the user will not notice, right? And the trick that I want to play here is that if your app is the same, like your logic is the same, your data is the same, so you cache them, well, your HTML is the same, you also should cache it. So here's my brilliant idea. Every time a user changes a page, like adding a to-do, right? If it's Jamstack, it has to go over API, maybe, you know, redeploy, but in our case, we'll take the data and we'll take the HTML of a current page and we'll store it in local storage, right? Like literally cache the page and the data. And when you reload the page, you can just load that HTML from local storage, show it to the user, and while the user is looking at the static fake mock copy, absolutely static page, you can load your web application and hydrate it and start running it, okay? So this is what I was going to do. Here's how it looks in practice. Okay, okay, one second. It's loading an iframe. I really hope that this... Okay, so this is the page. Um, so in this page, right, I, I can add to-dos, I can remove to-dos. So four, right? And if I reload the page, Notice that it appears instantly, right? And you can see the color change because I purposely slowed down the hydration and live application bootstrap uh, by like 500 milliseconds or like a, or a two seconds maybe. What you see here comes from local storage while application is loading, right? So every time I remove it to do, the whole page HTML goes into the local storage. When I reload, I load that local storage thing, and that's what you see. And then application scaffolds, hydrates, shows itself, right? So this is kind of interesting combination of, uh, if I add many to those, right, and I reload, like the whole page just appears instantly, okay? So I've done it, right? It's just a small library that any framework can work with. Literally, it's, 
all it does, it does this. When it loads, inserts, um, you know, the saved HTML. And so when you actually load the page, you show that first, then the application loads, and it renders in a hidden div on your page, renders into, into a hidden div, then says, okay, I'm ready. And then it replaces the static content with actual live application, okay? I call it like progressive web app for like five cents because it's like literally the simplest thing you can do. Stick it in local storage, update whenever you want. When the user reloads, instant app. So you can find it, except it's not good enough, right? So uh, let me see if I can show a video. Basically, sometimes there is a flash, and I'll, I'll see if I can if I my next slide has a video. But basically, anytime you take something from local storage, you have to write it into your document. And when you do document write, but, but those things can have a flash where your static HTML and then new HTML will not really appear at the same time. So I have a little video right here. So notice that before, like I didn't have a, a flash, but sometimes when I run, there is a flash. Oh yeah, you saw that, right? There was a little flash. Let me show it again. Because so I add one more to do, right? And then I load the page, and there was a flash where the top of a page, st you know, stayed just fine. Right here. Oh, but it, it did flash because document right is has this weird thing where the browser might say, "Hey." I have to render you differently, and you will see this little flash of content. On the other hand, right? So forget client side. Take server side rendered application like this one. Whenever I reload the page, it comes in instantly, right? The server side pages have this beautiful property that when they arrive, they're ready to go. The browser is really good at rendering like megabytes of static HTML like that, like th they're super good about it. So every time you see like reload right here on the top, it's super fast, no blinking, but anytime I add an item or click on it to complete it, I have to reload the whole page and that's annoying, right? But the static part of reloading is super fast and super nice and no junk whatsoever. So I was thinking, how can we combine the best of both worlds? Server-side rendering that reloads the full page, but dynamic client-side work with a page where everything is smooth and nice. And this is where the service workers come into play. So this is a demo. You can check it out. I'm showing the video. Notice that I'm working with a page, I'm inserting to-dos, and I'm reloading a bunch of times. Look at the reload symbol right on the browser toolbar on top. I'm reloading a bunch of times here. You don't see any artifacts. And my application, as you can see from that little pop-up, is slowed down by 500 milliseconds. It doesn't load instantly, All right? So this is an interesting example. The whole page starts working right away. It's dynamic as any client-side app, and yet the, even the app itself is slow. So how is this possible? How? So what's happening here? So imagine you have your browser, and you have a service worker and, and the server. So you work with your page locally, as a user, you're adding to-dos, you're editing items, things like that. So that means your page changes. So on every change, whenever you want to like say, okay, uh, I wanna save it as a snapshot, you send to the service worker a message and you send part of a page that's dynamic. Just like this little part, like this list of to-dos that's dynamic. You don't send like the whole page, no headers, titles, because those things are static anyway. But the parts that the user can change, you send them to service worker and it just caches them. 
And then whenever a user wants to reload the page, the following happens. The browser says to the service worker, I need a new page. It goes to the server. And the server doesn't send the full page. I mean, it could, but really it sends something that is just, um, it has a header, a footer, just, just like the basic skeleton. And inside it has a place for the dynamic content. So when this page gets here, dynamic part is inserted into the server side rendered page. Now you have the full HTML, but combines static part from the server and dynamic part, like all the things you did client side. And you send the full page there. And again, as I said, browsers are really good at rendering static HTML without blinking, without any dynamic thing. Now this page arrives and this is a static page, like server side render page, but then you can just hydrate the rest and then it becomes dynamic. So the whole page, when you reload, arrives at once from the service worker. And anytime you edit an attitude, those updates get sent to the service worker to be cached, to be inserted. And every time, so it's just the best of both worlds. Okay, so this is the result of our previous uh, poll. So I think it's, it's the right target audience. I want to activate the next poll. Right, so I showed a bunch of examples already, um, how to do offline support, how to prefetch pages, how to do network marking, how to make client-side apps static yet without any junk. Um, based on what you've seen, which ones like is is most interesting to you as a web developer? Okay, okay, I I, I do agree. Those uh, instant web pages that work with any framework are pretty cool. Nobody likes network mocking, it's just me. That's fine, that's fine. I see that some people are intrigued by, can I see something cooler? Okay. So let's see something cooler. I think that's always uh, the right answer to any, of, uh, to, any, to any question. Thank you. So think about the fetch event, right? I've been talking about fetch event many times already. Anytime a browser needs something, it has to ask and it has to do HTTP request. That could be the page itself, the CSS, the JavaScript. Anytime it needs more information dynamically, it can do AJAX request. These all things, they go through service worker and they all go through fetch event. It's all standardized. Like that's the beauty of the fetch a protocol in so, inside service worker. So usually they go to the server, the server response goes back. So inside the service worker, when you deal with fetch event, you get a request object. It's pretty much the same request object as that you deal with when you do like a window.fetch. You send a request, it has certain properties, you get response. Has a, it's very standardized HTML5 API best standard. And then when you get to the server, Okay, one second, my, my presentation is a little bit lagging right now. Do, do, do. It's trying to load the next slide. Come on. But one thing I completely forgot to do for this presentation, Jim, is to get offline copy of it. Like I usually do it and I completely forgot about it. And come on. Uh, okay, so finally, when you get to the server, imagine you're working with JavaScript server. If you have a program node, when you deal with a request coming from some client, you get something from library HTTP. It's a client request, and when you send server response, again, it's standard you know, API in node land. Inside service worker, you write JavaScript. Inside Node.js, you write JavaScript. So why don't we take whatever we, we do here, right? In a server side world, 
which is just JavaScript, gets a request, computes result, sends it through response object. Why don't we take it and stick it inside service work? Because it's just JavaScript after all. And all you have to do, somehow take the request object that's part of HTML5 service worker protocol and convert it to client request that Express Server, for example, understands. And when Express Server produces a value, you have to convert it back to the response so you can give it back from the fetch event. So I've written something called Express Service. Um, it's, um, I'm, I'll just try to explain what you will see in a second. So the web application, the page in a browser thinks it's interacting with server-side rendered pages, right? There is no JavaScript there. It's just standard things, just like I've shown before for server-side pages. But the server doesn't run in somewhere on, on a server. Instead, it runs inside the service worker. I bundled up, converted everything, and just stuck that piece of JavaScript into the thing. So here it is in action. And let me play a video because I can't really do the demo and you'll see why of this right now. So notice the browser is working. I, I can add, remove items, but then I can open DevTools and I can disable JavaScript to demonstrate that this is completely server-side HTML page. There is no JavaScript on a client. That's why I can disable things. So it works without JavaScript. But then I can do one more thing to show how cool this is. I can go to network and I can go to offline mode, all right? And the page still keeps working because the server is not outside the browser, it's inside the service worker. Even though you have disabled JavaScript on this page, it doesn't disable the service worker. Right, And so it still responds, still renders the full pages, still sends them back. Usually I do this demo live, but I cannot you know, turn off Wi-Fi. Uh, that would be a really short demo. So this is the beauty of blurring the line between your browser and the server and where things run. So you can find all these videos online. You can find my little utility for, I, I don't really maintain it. it. It was just a proof of concept, but I thought it's really cool. So what else can people use Service Worker for? Uh, you can send push events to display notifications. You can transform the code on the fly, for example, to instrument the code for code coverage. You can um, transcode images and video on the fly as you send them to the browser. People can even figure out how to like send the whole website as a zip file, <laughs> which is, if you think about we zip or zip every resource, why not zip the whole site, right? And then service worker unzips it, has a file system and serves it as a static site. Uh, I underline uh, this website, service workers. This is a great resource from Mozilla, from Firefox people, bunch of examples of how to use service workers. You can even do offline analytics, right? You can store all the events in the service worker and then once it becomes you know, online, you can send them to, to your analytics server. Before we kind of finish, I have to say, if you think about it, the service workers have access to everything. If a hacker or malicious website gets a hold of your site and loads its own service worker, it will be pretty much impossible for you to get rid of, right? Because it can just rewrite the page and insert itself back in. So make sure don't suffer from cross-site scripting attacks because if they can load a ser uh, service worker, the game is over. It has access to pretty much all communications for the domain uh, from your page. So be, just be careful of that. I want to ask one more, maybe last poll of the night to kind of judge or see how people feel about service workers. Uh, this is a rating a star rating, give it one star if you don't care about service workers after my presentation, or five stars if you're really like excited. Uh, four is even better, right? Excited but cautious, I, I agree. Excellent, I, I personally feel service workers can be quite boring. 
people say, oh, just like add offline support, like cache your, you know, images and CSS. But I think they can go so much more beyond that. Excellent. Nice. I, I, I think this is a, was the right presentation for this crowd. Thank you. OK, so let me finish my presentation by just quickly saying the key takeaway, if you want to make offline progressive web application today, start using Service Worker. Like that's number one use case. Uh, lots of libraries that do that. Google has a great uh, Workbox JS. That's a great use case. And then go crazy. Once you figure out how simple it is and it's just JavaScript, you can do things that I've shown here, like rewriting pages, running servers. That's the sky is your limit after that. But use it responsibly. If you screw it up and you completely break offline mode, it will be very hard to explain to user. Open DevTools, go to application, find a button, make sure like clear all the resources is checked, and then kill all your tabs, and, and then maybe it will work again. No, it's it's hard. Um, I've done a, a presentation a long time ago in New York with uh, Nolan Lawson, who is unbelievably good developer, where he, it's a twofer. He talks about web workers, and I talk about service workers. So if you want to cover both of them in one video, absolutely great part uh, from him. It's just really, really nice. And then and something else that came up last year that I, I only had like one experience of it, but it was like really nice. If you understand service worker, how it reacts to fetch event, you don't have to even write service worker. Cloudflare allows you to run same API, same JavaScript inside CDN, like on the edges. So you have a mobile device with no like uh, service worker support, no problem. You can make your service worker like API with like whole fetch logic, run it on Cloudflare and all the users will will use that like really interesting uh, technology choice absolutely brilliant i think absolutely brilliant idea okay so this is the end of my presentation you can find the slides at slides.com and if you're in massachusetts please talk to me or participate in better future project or 10 minute heroes where we ask for one thing to do 10 minutes a month at 10 minuteheroes.com thank you very much i'm I'll open, let's see, come on, load, load my, okay, I see a couple of questions. Okay, one second. Uh, while this is loading, let me just uh, drag Slido right here so I can answer those questions, one second. Do, do one second, almost there. I'm dragging, dragging, dragging. Okay. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, Q and A. So let me close. Okay. Okay. So let me answer this question. Have you noticed any blink when testing this cache method on a page with lots of CSS? Um, so I showed two, two different ways of caching. There is local storage one, and then there was one from service worker. I definitely noticed blinking when I use local storage. Because what happens, the browser starts loading the top of a page, then it hits, you know, document, right? You know, my little fragment. When it hits that, it has to stop everything reevaluate the CSS, right, and continue rendering from there. So there's definitely this pause and reevaluating in a blink. When you do service worker, when you render the full page and when it arrives, there is no blink because it's the same as rendering a page on a server. If you have lots of styles that are kind of deferred and the fonts change, then that, yes, but it's, it, it looks exactly as a normal server-side rendering site with like different fonts. But it, uh, you will not see a difference from service worker because the whole page arrives at once. And you can play cool things like, you know, optimize your CSS inside service worker, right? Um, 
inline styles. Basically, you have to evaluate which one is more performant, but it's, it was really not an issue. Uh, what are the performance characteristic uh, around service worker persistence when, when someone closing and opening browser windows? Excellent question. So as far as I remember, a single page can have multiple web workers, right? It can do mul it can use multiple threads, but four pages or multiple tabs or multiple windows from the same domain, they will all share a single service worker, right? Because it makes sense to cache the same way in, in a single place if you have the same website open from, like, let's say, two tabs. But means that if you're sending lots of things from one tab to the service worker and keep it busy, well, your second tab will suffer because now it has to like ask service worker that's constantly busy for the same information. But the cool thing about this is that the browsers have a policy on when they actually stop service worker and offload it. Even if you close the tab and then open it up, if it's like less than 24 hours, that service worker should be like ready to go. It's already like was installed. It just has to activate, which is very fast, right? It's not a full installation. If it's longer than like certain number of hours, then it will reinstall itself. And in that case, it'll, it will have to like do the caching maybe, but then I, I don't, I don't think it's, a, you, you can still control how long the cache works, right? So multiple tabs that point at the same domain will share the same uh, service worker. So just keep that in mind. Can service worker be thought as a state storage method? Uh, Absolutely. Yes. So imagine, um, imagine your Redux, right, or some kind of state storage mechanism. Instead of storing it inside your application, every time there is a change in state, you do asynchronous call or post message to say to the service worker, "Hey, this has changed." Um, this idea was really popular for a while in. UI frameworks, right? When people were trying to say, we're going to offload virtual DOM rendering to the web worker, and then we'll just ship the diffs back so that we can compute all the virtual DOM differences in a separate thread from the main, and then we can just render whatever is result. Uh, ultimately, they, it all kind of died out because it introduces so much complexity. So I think you can offload your state updates and state storage to the service worker, but ultimately it will be more complex because you will not, everything that you could do like set state, now it has to be like, well, post a message, listen to the messages, what, what if the messages arrive and you still are doing something? So you could do it, should you? I'm not sure. Uh, and the last question, can I cache my entire app on first page request? And if so, what would be the performance implication? It depends on the page. If your page is something simple, like uh, like what I've shown, like to-do app, uh, let's say a small writing app, um, news like Y Combinator, then you can cache it whole and change it. Especially if you use like VDOM, you can just change the, the diff or like send the diffs of a page. I, I don't see you know any hit on performance, but if your page is giant, you know, imagine like Monica or like one of those VS Code editors inside your browser, trying to like constantly send the page over to the service worker will be tremendously non-performant. So, you know, your mileage can vary, but for simple, you know, pages, I would say sending the page, actually, no, your question was caching. Uh, caching should be fine, even for complex pages, it's just a static HTML request and then saving it. But that should be very fast. Unless you have like megabytes of stuff. Um, can service worker execute for up to 24 hour tabs after? Yes. So you have to, in this case, every browser is different. Chrome is different from Firefox. Firefox is different from um, Safari. Very, they have rules, right? Trying to minimize, you know, 
well, trying to optimize performance and also prolong the battery life. So Safari will cut you very quickly to save battery. Chrome will allow you to run for a little while longer, uh, but they all have rules that are pretty much well listed. And then um, I think 24 hours is the limit for Chrome, but I haven't looked at this in a long time. And I think this is, uh, this is then. So let me stop sharing if I can figure out how. I, th I think I've stopped sharing. Not sure. <laughs> yeah, you stopped sharing. There, there was one last question there. Oh. If you have a, you can cut it off whenever you want, but you wanted to answer it. Oh. OK, so the last question. One second, let me just move. How are database requests dealt with if when the user loses the internet connection? Does the server's worker continue utilizing the same data? So I'm not sure what happens in this case, right? Uh, I think that depends really on, on the logic inside the service worker JavaScript code. The only, uh, the only one thing I can really suggest is that don't code this logic yourself, right? So the Nolan Lawson that I mentioned before, he worked on a team that did PowHDB, which is open source in browser database. It, it might not be the fanciest database, it's really simple database, but it had absolutely killer feature and still has. It can sync with remote CouchDB database, right? And then connection is lost. It will reconnect whenever it's available. The connection gets back on online. And then it will sync its state and intelligently update itself and merge all the operations. So you can continue from that point. And you can continue through the whole offline as well, right? So when I was, when I were, I was thinking about like offline apps, I was like, don't even deal with offline functionality. You know, use service worker for resources so you can load them if you are offline. But for database requests, just use PowHDB, work with your local database. In reality, that database will sync itself intelligently with remote database, but it's such a nice piece of machinery that's complex, but it was done for you, but you will never have to worry about it. Just use PowHDB it will take care of the whole offline, online, syncing, restoring the state, but you will work with local database as if you were online, perfect connection all the time. So that's my answer to that. Nice job, that's great. <laughs> well done. Thank you, thank you. Is PouchDB an open source project or? Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, cool. yes. And CouchDB is uh, open source. And CouchDB, I, I don't know now, but I know I knew that they ran uh, NPM registry, right? So the backend for NPM, which is has huge growth, was just CouchDBs. So it, it's a really impressive project. Wow. That's cool. Um, so we saw a bunch of people sitting on the, the chat. I mean, um, feel free. We, we can leave this open as long as people want. I'll probably close it down in the next 10 minutes or so if, if no one's <laughs> talking. But um, feel free to ask more questions informally, talk about anything you want, or hop off and go on with your night. Um, but thank you so much for the, the talk. That was really awesome. Oh, um, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation. Really nice. Hey, Gleb, I just want to thank you again for, for the talk. Uh, really. Really good talk. Like learn more a lot about service worker and its interaction with the browser. So I'm gonna sign off. So I think my um, my browser is actually overloading on me. So I think I need to give it a rest. But um, thank you again for the talk, Leb. And I, I hope we can uh, stay in contact with soon. You can um, speak in another Jamtech event. Absolutely. Thank you, Lucas. I appreciate. I appreciate right, no it. No problem. Have a great night, later. Jim, Stephanie, everybody. Have a great night. Club. I remember my uh, my first uh, uh, service. I was playing around with Sapper. Sapper is a really cool project. And I was yep. using like their static export stuff, and I was like using my local server, and and then I like shut it down. I like tore 
throw it all down. And I, like I went back there and I, this app was still working. Yeah. And I was just like, wait, what the heck is happening here? And I, I was like, I thought I had it like open in a different like shell or something like that, mm -hmm. but it's just the service work was taken over. It was really cool that it, it set all that up like behind the scenes automatically without any configuration or anything. It's just like based on, based on the routes I was creating. It was really cool. I, I, I think the example I showed from the prefetching, I forgot where I took it, but I think it was Sapper, I believe, right? It could be Sapper, it could be Next JS. I forgot, honestly. Yeah. But, um, you know, the interesting thing about that is that some frameworks, they added Service Worker and then took it out, right? Like uh, hmm. create React app. They have Service Worker, they enable then quickly disable because people running into troubles like that where we didn't expect things to be cached. Mm -hmm. Or like, or they were not cached as they thought they would be. Like, it, it's caching is hard, just like naming. Yeah. Joe, what's up? Hi, Joe. <laughs> um, Here we yeah, go. So now my mic muted. Hey, how are you doing? Oh man, I'm hanging in there. Thanks, Leb. That was awesome. I had a quick question. Uh, is it pouch, P O U C H D B, or was it couch DB with a so C? I, the confusion is couch DB was the initial database that handled like syncing very well. And pouch DB is just JavaScript client that people have written to talk to pouch. I mean, to couch. Sorry. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, so two pouch databases can sync between themselves. Or PouchDB can sync to CouchDB. Interesting. Yeah. So the CouchDB is the server version. PouchDB can run in any JavaScript environment. Node, browser, things like that. I feel like that was maybe a poor name choice. They sound the same. They kind of work together. There's probably a little confusion going on there. Uh, you know, uh, it, it might be, but you know, it's, it's their decision ultimately. I don't use them. I had just heard of couch and I looked and I was like, oh, I wonder if that's a typo. And I went to Google and I was like, nope, there's a pouch DV. <laughs> so thank you for clearing that up, how they work. Oh, my pleasure. Are you using uh, couch DB on Projects Club or just something you, you're familiar with the guy? No, just something I familiar with i think i've done just like a bunch of experiments but i never have to code anything complex nowadays right it's <laughs> it's, it's just testing or coding yeah. things for testing <laughs> i'm sure there's no challenges there yeah <laughs> no but that's why like i'm interested in like service workers for like testing how your app handles networking because mm -hmm. you don't have to install anything you just say service worker and then your app thinks everything is normal, but you can control the service work and say, okay, now stop everything, right? Mm -hmm. Or return 502, but after a delay, like those are interesting edge cases, but so hard to test and like, does your app handle them? Yeah. Right, like those are things. And if you can just do it from outside the application with no code change, really, right? it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you made a good point in your presentation about like, reining this stuff in and like it like it seems it does seem like it's kind of the thing that you like you let Pandora out of the box it's hard to to put it back in like once you've kind of set this out because you lose a little bit of control uh once you get once you put it in their browser I guess and it's kind of running off on its own yeah but um it's not gonna stop me from playing around with it no it's a great I, I think this is a great browser API that we might not appreciate as much but it does allow you to do unbelievable things, right? Where people say, for like Android phones, especially back in the day, like, yeah, my Android could go offline in like South America, Africa, you know, parts of Asia where I had no signal most of the day. My app still worked. I was in the field, like doing everything on my app, come back, it uploaded the data whenever it, like, I, I didn't even like do anything. And it was mm -hmm. a web app, not a native app. Like, which, yeah, it's crazy. Which, yeah, there's so many situations. I, I don't know, Rick, if you experience it in Western Mass, but when I'm out in Western Mass, there's lots of 
places like my hometown of Worthington, there's like no service anywhere. So there'd be so many times where it'd be nice to be able to view things offline. And the idea of like pouch is really cool. Like I like the idea of being able to like continue saving and doing things and then just be like, hey, I'll sync up eventually and yeah. then have that persistent data that way. It sounds so cool. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, Jim, it was finally good to be able to make it to this. <laughs> to yeah, make, no, I'm glad. Drive yeah. four hours. Boy, I've been, yeah, in the, th I've been in the PHP world forever and just learning about this JavaScript world is just amazing. It's just really, yeah. it's just unbelievable. Yeah, the innovation in JavaScript is so fast. It's like too fast for me for the most part because you know, it's, just, it's just overwhelming, but the innovation that's happening in, in JavaScript is crazy with all the different UI frameworks and oof. And it's kind of just been the last decade, right? After yeah. Node came out or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, because then it became super, just super convenient, really, right? Of one stack. Yeah, and I think when they got like the new, you know, like arrow functions and let and things like that, and they, they got like some of the, the scoping down and a little more sane, I think people were just in async await and all that. I think people were really just like, oh, this is, this is not so bad. Right. And compared, like, it might not be the best language, but it has a well-defined mechanism that's been working for five years now for adding and improving stuff year after year. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't see any other language having that, right? Where, like, yeah, once in a while, a new version of C comes out. Who cares anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Or, like, whenever Java does something. But in JavaScript nowadays, boom, 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 like a clock. Yep. And it seems like kind of a good thing that you're using the same language on the server that you are in the client. I don't know. Yeah, the browser definitely helps, right? It's like, hey, you know, well, I guess you got you got um, WebAssembly and stuff like that now. But, you know, previously, it's like, that's your choice, right? So you're going to have to learn JavaScript no matter what you're doing. Whether you're a Ruby developer or whatever, you could still need to know JavaScript. So, um, right. Cool. All right. Well. Unless people have pressing things they want to discuss with each other, I was thinking I might close this thing down. We made it to 8 o'clock. Yep. It seems like a good cutoff time. Can I throw a quick question at you guys? Yeah. So I come at this from more of a systems and operations background, and one thing that comes up often when people are talking about the Node.js environment and NVM is um, the security uh, track record, people typo squatting package names and packages having vulnerabilities slip in that, that are unstated. Is that something that any of you folks think about as you go about using these packages in your development? And if so, what does that look like or what do you do differently as a result? Yes, um, uh, Chris, right? Yes. So I'll, I'll post in the chat my presentation about this security. So, yeah, there are problems, right? Just like in any environment. Uh, the good thing about security, at least in, in browser, is the browser vendors, they have this box, right? Where it's more or less secure unless there's some escape mechanism, like cross-site scripting. Mm -hmm. So in majority, like that's a lot more secure. When people download and write and, and run some npm package on the server well that's a huge security hole right mm -hmm. and uh it's it, i don't think it's even like the type squatting but in that presentation i, I give examples of like left pad and what happened after that and kick cat kick gate it, it, it's just lack of policy where people do reviews of npm modules and depends on their brain but it's not unique to note if you take like top let's say 90% of Docker images.